So for those who don't know me, my name is Robert Scott, and it's still that name if you do know me anyway. David, come and join us. A grand entrance, quite right. Um, I was asked to host this panel uh, by Jay, clearly because I'm a lily-livered British person in need of American help. So thank you, Jay. Um, I'm down as a reverend, but I'm not. I have studied theology at a couple of different places, along with uh, other degrees, but I'm not officially uh, a reverend. I am uh, on staff at a church in the city of London and work largely in, in East London uh, amongst Bangladeshi Muslim people. And in our particular area, there's about 100,000 uh, Saleti Bangladeshi Muslim people and maybe five or six uh, followers uh, of Jesus. Uh, I've been, been go involved in some meetings for better understanding, which is midway between a kind of interfaith group hug and nasty polemics where people fight one another. Thank you. Um, and written a couple of books off the back of those as well. We've just started a church, uh, some people from my church and other churches in our area, and some American missionaries amongst Saleti Bangladeshi people in both Saleti uh, and in English. And do, I do some teaching at a theological college as well. So that's me, and then we're going to have 90 seconds from each of the panel here introducing themselves, and then I'll be asking them various questions and hopefully muting them at various points if they go on too long, because I feel it might be tricky hosting these cats in a bag. Anyway, George, introduce yourself. And uh, How did you get into polemics? How did I get into polemics? Okay. Uh, George Saik with Ministry to Muslims. Uh, we, our job in the United States is to make Jesus known among Muslims. Uh, uh, polemics, uh, I find it uh, as debating and discussing one-on-one -on -one with Muslims that uh, there's no way around it. I have to use it. It just came natural. <laughs> we have to do it. Uh, they need to be challenged. Otherwise, they think they are in a perfect place where they don't look for something else. Once Islam is challenged, that's when they are more open now to seek something, something else. Thank you. Chris, introduce yourself and why polemics. Hi there. Oh, there we go. Um, so I was raised in an atheist household and I became a Christian at the age of 17 and I immediately became interested in being able to demonstrate my faith practically and logically um, and that led me to science and philosophy and history and initially it was towards atheists but then later I found the work of Dr. J. Smith. He introduced me to the whole Islamic question and I realized there's an entire other group of people that I can, I can practice polemics to. <laughs> And, uh, and so I did, and long story short, um, I ended up in Speaker's Corner two years ago and giving polemics to many Muslims there. Thank you. David, many of us will know you, but many of us don't. Introduce yourself and how you got into polemics. Uh, I'm David Wood. Uh, as Johnny Lawrence from The Karate Kid and Cobra Kai said, the best defense is more offense. And so uh, that, that, that has stuck with me. But oh, I, I got into uh, polemics, uh, having discussions with Nabil, and a lot of it started off with him giving arguments for Islam that I would then go look up in the Muslim sources, he'd give them like a scientific miracle or something like this, but then I would find all this other stuff, and then I would go back to him and find out that he's really bothered by that other stuff I would bring up in the same source. And so it was just, it was just basically, uh, it was just basically trial and error, and it was that combined with, it seemed like back then Muslims were always on the attack against Christianity, and Christians had been trained not to attack Islam, and so like this is like, this is insane. This is insane, letting them blast away at you, and you just try to defend your point, and you never point out all this stuff about Muhammad and the Quran, so anyway, it was just, I think someone needs to do this, and so I started doing it. Thank you. Bob, same to you. Um, I got into polemics because a, when I was 13, a Muslim tried to convert me to Islam, and uh, that backfired catastrophically. And um, I started learning how to argue back to this Muslim who was attacking Christianity. And then I got into Speaker's Corner because of Jay Smith. Um, he doesn't remember this, which always breaks my heart. But uh, we met at a Roger Forster ICTUS uh, July project event, which was for university students. And uh, me and, you know, everyone had sort of pinned me as the Islam guy. 
And then Jay came, and in everyone else's minds, it's all oh, like you and Jay, yeah. And he invited me to Speaker's Corner, I went down there, and, and went loads and loads of times, none of which Jay remembers. Um, and then, yeah, that's it. When heroes don't remember you, it's very sad. Jay, same question to you. I'm the guy that he's talking about. I, I don't remember that, but I'm just glad the Muslims are the ones who really taught me how to do polemics. I think when you engage with Muslims, they are so passionate. They're such lovely people, and I just love to copy them. The, bad, the great thing is they're hopeless at defense. So why not use polemics? Thank you. So I've got a series of questions just for each individual, um, and then we'll kind of go discussion after that. This topic is uh, why do Christians dislike polemics? Bob, why do Christians dislike polemics? Why do Christians here, why do specific Christians that you know dislike polemics? Um, I, I think it is because the church is in the grip of comfortable people. And I think that the, a, a lot of the people who are in charge of the church have a reason not to be involved in polemics in the sense that it involves confrontation. And confrontation could very well lead to sacrifice, or it could lead to some kind of loss, or it could see, lead to some kind of trouble. And we have a lot of comfortable people in church that have a lot to lose. And so anything that might endanger their comforts, um, they shy away from. And it's not just polemics. It's any controversial issue. Any controversial issue. Even if it's nothing to do with attacking another religion. And it, that, that, that sense of comfortable people wanting to secure their comforts is a, a big reason why they are averse to any controversial issue. And polemics are, by their nature, controversial. So it kind of fearfulness and desire for comfort specifically without necessarily naming or shaming people can you give a specific example of someone saying you shouldn't be doing this um yeah i well i mean i'm, I'm not so quite sure what you mean by naming someone i i, I know lot I, I would say that it, I'm, I'm gonna be classist here but we're in the uk and that's okay because yep. we're, we're a class-based society um but it's the middle classes uh, put you, you're all into polemics at some level. Put your hands up if you're working class. Working class. <laughs> was, was. Put your hands up if you're middle class. Yeah? So the, it, 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 there's a higher proportion of, of working class people here in this group than there are in your average fellowship. Because your average fellowships are, are middle class enterprises. And it, it, is, it is the comforts of a middle-class society that, uh, and middle-class Christians who don't want to engage in that which is controversial. And, and so I've encountered pastors. I'll, I'll give you an example of a particular church. We were going to have this conference in another church. And that other church, when they found out what we were doing, dropped us like a hot potato. Because it, it's just uncomfortable. You know, this is a hot potato for a lot of Christians. And I, I, I put it down to the fact that, that you've got comfortable people who know that if you get involved in controversial issues, you, you end up in conflicts. Conflicts lead to sacrifices. And, and there's a lot of people in the church that have got a lot to lose. Hmm. But again, it's not just polemics. It's any controversial issue. Yeah, it, It's costly being a Christian, and we find that difficult where we are. Thank you. Uh, George, what's the biblical basis for what you do, and what have you seen that's effective in the US and in Sudan, and is it effective amongst all kinds of Muslim people? The first part- Biblical missed, basis for what you do. Sorry? The biblical basis. In regular basis, okay. Uh, regular basis, uh, one of the things we do is uh, we stand outside mosques, and as Muslims coming out, we share the gospel with them, and also, things that we start doing is to set up the different readings of the Quran at Arabic festivals. And it is very challenging to Muslims, especially young people. Uh, they realizing that their leaders lying to them and they just take their phone and start taking pictures of these Qurans. And uh, it doesn't require a lot of work, but it's very, because this is the lie they've been told all their life. The Quran is perfect. Mm -hmm. And as they're walking away, we ask them, what else they lie to you about? I said, what do you mean? <laughs> oh, they told you the Quran is perfect, and now you discover it's not. 
What did they tell you about the Bible? And is this the same? So you've got experience in America and in Sudan. Is it the same kinds of things in both places? No, in Sudan it's different. In Sudan it's uh, mostly first we connect one on one and uh, then we do outreaches. Uh, but we have uh, book fairs, Christian book fairs in, in parks and in the River Nile we have a boat that we rent once, once a year for a month where that's working with Operation Mobilization. The Muslims come uh, for the book fair and we have 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, trips in the river while we sharing the gospel or preaching the gospel to them. Uh, so, uh, Comparing Sudan to another Islamic countries, we had freedom in the past more than in North Sudan, more than any other country, while 2.5 million Christians been killed in the south of Sudan uh, by the northern Sudanese. Uh, last year, from April 13 to now, uh, there's a war happening. Two militaries fighting each other, but both are killing Christians, and both of them are destroying churches in Khartoum and other surrounding areas. So obviously a different context from the States in, in that angle. Thank you. David, you're obviously well known for your YouTube and videos and sometimes a mocking tone towards Islam. Um, does that kind of thing, do you think, work in relationship rather than just on a screen? Um. It's going to depend on the person, uh, and I have to clarify, uh, because I've, I've gotten messages from people at certain times who said, uh, yeah, David, hey, uh, you know, I met this Muslim at school, so I just went straight and said, hey, your prophet was a pedophile. I'm like, no, eh, don't, don't. There are all kinds of situations where I will bring that up, but, you know, not, not like if I'm really trying to get a discussion going. Uh, not, if, I'm, if I'm having a one-on-one -on -one discussion, uh, it's going to be a, a different kind of scenario. So uh, I, would normally, I would normally tell people, like if you're starting off a conversation with someone, just start asking questions about what that person believes, then start asking that person's reasons for why he or she believes those things, and then start, uh, hey, can we talk about some of these reasons? And I'd be happy to look into those. And so if you believe these things about Islam, why don't we look into these things together and stuff? And, but at, at the end of the day, there is information about Muhammad that you do want to get across to the person because that person's never heard these things. They heard Muhammad is the greatest man ever, the Quran is the greatest book ever, and so on. And so you need to point out, you have to expose those lies. And really this goes, um, uh, again, something else I learned from Nabil, that after he became a Christian, he told me, he said, after we'd had discussions for years, I realized Christians have good reasons for everything they believe. And he says, but even when, I was, even when I was realizing that Christians have good reasons for what they believe, it was still in my head. Even if they showed me with 99% certainty that Jesus is the son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead, I'm still 100% sure that Islam is true because of the scientific miracles and because of the perfectly preserved Quran and so on. So it wasn't until all those things were challenged that he, 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 he lost that 100% certainty that he thought he had because he'd been lied to all his life. And so it was massively important, but as far as how you present it, mainly I just thought no one's kind of doing it this way. And so it's kind of someone needs to do it this way, and everyone's presenting in this way, and there are some people in the world who will gladly listen to you uh, blasting away. And also part of it was um, I, I noticed that people in the Muslim world, they responded more effectively to an aggressive approach. Like... They didn't respect you if you weren't aggressive. If you weren't aggressive, they didn't think you really believed what you were talking about. And so it was them. But Christians in the West, they get very kind of upset about that if you're being aggressive. So I ended up kind of being aggressive with the information, but joking and having a smile on my face so that the Christians didn't think I'm just like extremely nasty, just nasty and yeah. so on. So, hey, if I, I've got a smile on my face and I'm joking and I'm telling jokes and, and so on. And so it was, just, it was just trial and error over time. And then I just noticed over time, lots of people were responding to that. So I just kept rolling with it. Yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, context is important. And we'll, we'll come back to the, the culture thing um, in a bit. Chris, um, at Speaker's Corner, is it just alpha males trying not to wear the cone of shame? No. Um, Speaker's Corner has a, a wide variety of different people from all sorts of different perspectives and different temperaments. Um, there are some people that are very meek and very patient. And I can think of people like Paperboy, uh, David, who's here as well tonight. He's also very patient. And there are others who are able to listen and, and, and 
keep things on the down low and not let things get heated. Um, so th there is kind of a balance of different perspectives and different ways of going about evangelizing and engaging in polemics. You can be polemical. You can be very, very polemical. You can bring up all the, the harsh points. You can bring up like Aisha's age and, and whatever uh, you, you want to bring up, but you can do it in a way that's meek. And by meek, I'm, that's not a synonym for weakness. That's not how I see it. But rather be meek in the sense that you are giving them as much as they need to be able to hear their own nonsense as they say it, because I do believe that the Islamic perspective is wrong, but also being able to correct it when they finally do let you speak, and then you can say, hey, what you just said, here's why that's wrong. This is being recorded, and others can see that. So that's kind of how I approach it. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back to, to meekness um, as well. Jay, the granddaddy of it all, um, what's your experience been here, and, and what do you think has changed over the last 25, 30 years, and do you have to have a big voice to do it? I know. I'm, I'm the... I've gotten a lot older, a lot grayer, and that's what's changed, and I've got a lot fatter. But as far as the polemics, it's, it's changed enormously, because back in the 1990s, it was much more violent. We got an awful lot of, we got punched all the time. And then, of course, 9-11 happened, and the narrative changed, and now suddenly Islam was religion of peace. Once they were a religion of peace, they had to prove it, and that made it an awful lot easier at Speaker's Corner. But what really changed, I think, was when Hatun found the, the, the Kirats. The Kirats and the Ahruf really changed everything for us because that showed that there was a real problem with their Quran. And once that was shown and once that infamous, as you were talking about earlier, David, the uh, hole in your narrative interview that happened on June 8, 2020, that has had enormous reaction all across the world. That's made it a lot easier. And I want to just bring up... Polemics has always been a problem for the British church. It's been a problem for all of Europe. Not as much of a problem in America yet, and I'm glad for that. But it is, we, um, and I was just talking to Odin over there. He says it's not this big a problem in France as it is here in the United Kingdom. So what has changed, I think, is because we have got much better. We have a lot better speakers. Uh, this young next generation come up, coming up are much better than the, us old guys. But also the material has changed. We just, I've, it is so easy now to really confront the Quran, confront Muhammad, and also confront their God and confront their city. These are the things we never had 40 years ago. We didn't have the books that you have now. We didn't have the material, the, the type of training that I squared is putting out and that we're putting out on the MAPI program. So what has changed? Goodness sakes, I just wish I was 40 or 50 years younger and I could start all over again, be these guys' age, because they have an awful lot going for them that we didn't have those of us who are gray hair. Thank you. You talked um, at the beginning um, of this morning, uh, polemics as offense, um, the kind of the Mo Salah of Liverpool scoring, so it's not just Ronaldo, but, but Salah as well. Clearly, offense are the people that score, so let's think about scoring um, in a sense. What research is there that shows that this is scoring goals? For all of you, yeah. Yeah. Well, this isn't so much research, but it is just observation. What we see at Speaker's Corner, I think, is proof that what we say and the polemics we use has a big effect. Um, it, we're now in a position where the Christians at Speaker's Corner are more numerous, they're more knowledgeable about Islam as a religion, just in a whole sense. They're able to bring things up that th the Muslims don't have answers to, and the response that we see coming from the, the higher-ups, the sheikhs, the, the dabagandists is... Mm -hmm. Stay away from them. Don't talk to the Christians because you, we can't defend you if you do that. If the Christian brings up Aisha, we, we, we don't really have a proper response for that. And, and, and so on. So for that purpose, yeah, I think Speaker's Corner is one of the signs. Mm -hmm. Check, check. Uh, Muhammad Hijab actually did a poll on, uh, on this a few years back and he asked Muslims, he said, Muslims, when you doubt Islam, what is the main source of your doubt about Islam? Is it problems with Muhammad's character? Is it uh, powerful presentations of alternatives to Islam? Is it, and we went down a list and so on. And the number one, by far the number one response was moral problems with Muhammad. And so it's like, hey, thank you for that information. That is, that is good to know. But anyway, that's, 
That's exactly, that's exactly what we see, um, that people, you know, generations in the past didn't have this information about Muhammad. They lived in a bubble where they only hear about Islam from their sheikhs and imams. The rest of the world doesn't know anything about Islam to respond to those kinds of things. And so they don't, they don't know. But I mean, the, the apostasy rate of young, of young people went from close to 0% to 24% in like 15 years. Where's that? The, the 24%, it's, it's Muslim scholars have been throwing a, throwing a tantrum. They call it the, uh, the avalanche of apostasy. They're is, panicking. That, is that in the West? Is that across the world? Is that... Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure that would, that would be the, I, I'm guessing that's the West. There, there was a study of uh, 100,000 people each year uh, leaving Islam just in the United States of America and so on. So you can kind of look at the results. It's, they're the ones who call it the avalanche of apostasy. They're the ones who are in panic mode. And so... Yeah, you can just basically look at the last 20 years, as soon as people started sharing information about Islam, as soon as non-Muslims started learning about Islam and exposing the things that the Muslim, uh, the, the Muslim scholars and the Dawah guys were saying, um, that's when you started seeing the apostasy rate shoot up massively. And so I, I think that's a... Uh, Thank you. And Chris, you also mentioned um, Dawagandis trying to avoid you at Speaker's Corner. Bob, you're, you're at Speaker's Corner. How has it been in terms of results? I think faithfulness, we're called to faithfulness and God brings the fruit, but what, what fruit have you seen? Um, is Luca here? Brother Luke, is he here? I, 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 where is he? Is he here? He was here. Yeah, th those of us from Speaker's Corner know who Luke is. Mm -hmm. right? Put your hand up if you know who Luke is. Keep your hand up if you knew that Luke was a Muslim previously. He got baptized this year. And, and he's not the only one. There's a number of, I know of at least, uh, there, there was a, a brother that contacted me who, there's a video of him challenging me at the corner. He's a young Muslim, Salafi, beard, angry, menacing, hooded. Um, and there's this video that he sent to me when he sent me the email saying that he'd confronted me, but now he has returned to the Christian faith, and he's now a, a deacon in the Orthodox Church. There's another video of, it, it's the one where I get in a scuffle with um, Hamza the, the ginger pirate, um, and he, th there's a young lad who grabs me from behind, and say, because me and um, Hamza had got in a scuffle, and he, got, and, he, and he pretends to be a Christian, and he goes, I'm a Christian, and this behavior is completely unchristian, and no Christian would do that. My grandparents are devout Christians, and they would be ashamed of you. It turns out he was actually a Muslim. He, he was another convert that the Muslims had made. Well, he contacted me a year after that event, and he'd returned to the faith. And the things that led him to that were partly my videos, but also Muhammad admitting that Muslims pray to Muhammad, you know, in his debate with David Wood, um, you know, the one in the US. So we know of converts from the corner who are either from a Muslim background or had converted to Islam and have now become Christian because of our work. And then that is not even to mention the number of emails that I get or, the, or, or comments in the comment section, or people. I've got people who come to in my covenant partner meetings. There's a, a, a sister that comes to my covenant partner meetings. She was a Muslim. She she'd converted when she married. Uh, th th this is the brother. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> That's going to confuse him. Don't tell him why. <laughs> We're just but glad there, you're here. Yeah, but there's there, there's a sister whose entire who, whose da two daughters they were all Muslims, and they are now covenant partners with me, which means that they fund my work. They were all Muslim, having married a Muslim and had children to the in the Muslim family. But now they're all Christian, and their son they are confident is going to become a Christian soon. So there is lots of evidence. I have personally heard testimonies of people becoming Christians because of my work at Speaker's Corner. Thank you. Thank you. That is so encouraging. Just to, to come back to kind of the, the meekness um, points, I don't see a lot of meekness. 